Thank you, Tom. I tried to find a, a background that was a beach scene, so my slides reflect this. And actually, when I looked out the back, it looks a lot like the, the view from Mobile Bay. So again, that's the choice for this. See if I can advance this correctly. In terms of disclosures, I don't have any personal financial relationships with pharmaceutical companies. I put this second bullet in because I am a sub-investigator on a Pfizer NCCN educational grant. This caused a lot of grief with my CME organization locally when we organize presentations, but it's really an NCCN grant. I'm not going to discuss any off-label indications of drugs, and as Dr. Butler mentioned, the reason I'm speaking to you following many prestigious, excellent speakers that he and I have been friends for a long time, so if you don't like my talk, you know who to complain to. <laughs> okay, I have four objectives for this talk. One is to discuss the significance of thrombosis in cancer. The second is to discuss how cancer initiates thrombosis. The third is to review some of the current medical evidence we have that has led to guideline recommendations for prophylaxis and treatment of venous thromboembolism in cancer patients. And then last, one of the themes of this conference is to incorporate the Choosing Wisely initiative uh, into these talks, and I'll bring in those aspects related to thrombosis and again make comments related to cancer patients. So why did Dr. Butler add this to the schedule? Well, I think most of you know if you treat patients with cancer that thrombosis is a significant problem. Agnes Lee in this first paper estimated that about one of every 200 cancer patients is affected by cancer. In a Dutch retrospective registry analysis, patients with cancer who developed a venous thromboembolism had a two-fold increase in mortality compared to matched cancer patients who did not have a venous thromboembolism. In another study of hospitalized neutropenic cancer patients, the in-hospital mortality was greater if there was a thrombotic event. An odds ratio of two for venous thromboembolism and five for arterial thromboembolism. Dr. Karana, in one of his papers, indicated that venous thromboembolism is the second most common cause of death in cancer patients uh, on chemotherapy, and the, the first cause is progression of disease. So it's a significant burden for patients. So what is the spectrum of thrombotic disorders in cancer? Well, mostly what we see is deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. We also can see migratory thrombophlebitis, either involving deep veins or superficial veins. We can see non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis or morantic endocarditis. We can see arterial thromboembolism and chronic disseminated intravascular coagulation where thrombosis is the presenting feature, not bleeding. And most of the literature we have relating to thrombosis and cancer relates to venous thromboembolism. And that's primarily what's addressed in the organizational guidelines I'll be talking about. And most talks you'll hear, or book chapters, or whatever, again, focus primarily on venous thromboembolism. This is uh, a slide of the rates of venous thromboembolism related to various cancers. And this is from a paper by Gettings and Mackman in Blood a couple of years ago. There was a series of a couple of, uh, of articles related to thrombosis and cancer. Actually, this article was more related to the mechanism of the development of thrombosis and cancer, but in the introduction, they give, gave these figures. And I think you can see, again, there's wide variability depending on the population studied, but up to a quarter of patients with pancreatic cancer and brain cancers can have thrombosis. Lymphomas and myeloma it can be up to 50%, depending on different features. 
lung cancer, colorectal cancer, and breast cancer up to 10%. And so it's a significant problem for certain patients. Well, what are the risk factors that lead to thrombosis? And again, the site of malignancy, as we saw on the previous slide, and the stage. More advanced disease or metastatic disease correlates with a greater risk. Then age, over 65, gender, female, ethnicity, African American, greater than Caucasian, greater than Asian. And then the standard risk factors we see in patients who don't have cancer. Obesity, immobilization, hospitalization, surgery, and anesthesia. And then the things we do to patients during the course of our treatment add to that risk. Chemotherapy, hormonal therapies, anti-angiogenesis therapy, EPO, and blood transfusion therapy. And then we tend to place central venous catheters in to facilitate our treatments, and they add to risk factors primarily for catheter-associated thrombosis. In the mid-19th century, Virchow proposed three factors that lead to the development of venous thrombosis. One is alterations in the constitution of the blood, or what we call hypercoagulability vessel wall injury and alterations in the blood flow or stasis. And all of these play some role in the development of venous thrombosis. Cancer is actually a hypercoagulable state and there are a number of different observations that support that. And one is that, that fibrinogen and factor VIII, which are coagulation zymogens, um, are phase reactants, and they tend to be elevated in cancer patients. Factor seven, which is, the, uh, initi is, is important in the extrinsic, coagula extrinsic coagulation system, tends to be increased in many cases as well. Then we have an increased platelet count often. And platelets are the template for the conversion of the coagulation mechanism. So we have, again, more surface to, 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 to promote coagulation. We have evidence of increased thrombin generation signaling activation of the clotting system. Thrombin antithrombin complexes have been recorded as elevated. And then Activation peptides, the prothrombin fragments F.1 and 2, tend to be elevated. So again, we have thrombin activation, which has been described. We see increased D-dimers often, and this signals that we have activation of coagulation and then development of fibrinolysis to cleave the fibrin clot to form these D-dimers. And then there, there may be evidence of decreased fibrinolysis to dissolve clot with increased plasminogen activator inhibitor levels described. And then P-selectin is a protein which allows platelets which roll along blood vessel walls to adhere to sites of injury. And so again, if that's increased, we might have greater attachment of, of, of platelets. The way I look at it is, is with venous thrombosis in cancer, we have contributions of both inflammation and hemostasis. Normally, when we form a clot, we have fibrin and red cells together with variable amounts of platelets and white cells that, that adhere to the valve cusp pockets behind the valves in the leg veins, usually in the calf, or in, in areas of veins that are exposed to direct trauma. And one finding that's been described consistently is that tumor cells can constitutively express tissue factor. And they do this packaging it into microparticles, which then are released into the circulation and can then go to these sites of injury or to these valve cusps. And tissue factor is what triggers the extrinsic coagulation mechanism. In addition, tumor-associated macrophages and endothelial cells can also be induced to express tissue factor locally by either cytokines or by tumor-specific antigens. And 
these macrophages and endothelial cells that have been converted can again be a template for coagulation. P and E selectins mediate not only the attachment of, of platelets to vessel walls, but also of platelets to tumor cells and the adhesion of cancer cells to the endothelium. And there's also been described a cancer procoagulant, which is a cysteine protease. The coagulation factors are serine proteases. And again, this cysteine protease can activate coagulation. One of the instances it's been described is acute promyelocytic leukemia. We have a number of guidelines out there. Um, I think there are four that, that I look at in terms of uh, deciding how to treat a patient. The ACCP guideline is a very large guideline, mostly outlining treatments for a various number of, of, of thrombotic conditions, most of them not related to malignancy, but with sections or parts that, that relate to malignancy. And then there are three cancer-specific guidelines. ASCO has developed one in 2013. The NCCN has a, a fairly large one that they, they have developed. And then the European Society of Medical Oncology developed one in 2011. The way they develop these is slightly different. In ESMO, for instance, there were only two individuals who developed this, one expert medical oncologist and one expert hematologist in thrombosis. The others had panels of, of varying numbers of individuals. And ASCO formulated questions, answered them, and came up with recommendations. The NCCN and ESMO just went through different topics as they went along. I like this quote from Agnes Lee that I took from the ASH education program she presented last year in December. And she gave a talk on cancer and thrombosis. And this is from the published version that's in the education book or on, available online. And she stated, the guidelines are primarily based on extrapolated data from clinical trials in non-cancer patients, observational studies and registries, studies using surrogate outcomes and underpowered randomized controlled trials. Well, that doesn't sit well that we have a lot of strong data. Um, my review and looking at these guidelines and comparing them is, I think there's a general consensus of expert opinions on each of these panels with broad agreement on most topics, but there are some differences in focus and the strength of recommendations. So there is some concordance. Now I've been converted to case-based studies. I learn better related to, to, to patients I see. And so I've come up with four case scenarios I'll present and then use that as a, as a way to get into different discussions and teaching points. The first case is a 52-year-old man who presents with iron deficiency anemia, and he hadn't had a colonoscopy, he has one, and he's found to have a four centimeter sigmoid colon mass, which on the initial biopsy is a villus adenoma. He undergoes a left hemicolectomy, and the pathology re reveals in the, in the midst of this villus adenoma is a well-differentiated adenocarcinoma stage one, a PT1 lesion. He has a CEA and CT scans that are performed and they're normal. He was treated with sequential compression devices on his legs during the surgical admission, but he didn't receive any pharmacologic prophylactic anticoagulation because there was some concern about bleeding risk. So after he's released, the surgeon knew he wanted to talk to a medical oncologist because the patient knows that sometimes you get additional therapy. So you see him back a week after discharge and you tell him, I don't think you need any additional therapy. I think you'll do well with follow-up colonoscopies. But he says, oh doc, by the way, uh, my left thigh is sore and tender. And so you do a venous duplex Doppler examination and he's got a superficial femoral vein thrombus. Mm 
So certain questions come to mind to me. Does he need systemic anticoagulation or can he be treated for a superficial venous thrombosis? If he's treated with systemic anticoagulation, what are your choices? How long should he be treated and does he need hypercoagulability testing? Some teaching points. The first is that it can be confusing with the name of the, the superficial femoral vein. It's really part of the deep venous system and not part of the superficial system. Because it's a large vein, there is a risk of pulmonary embolism. This is brought out in the, the written discussion part in the NCCN guidelines behind the algorithm. And it's an important point to remember. To me, this was a provoked venous thromboembolism with the immobility, obesity, and surgery as precipitating factors. He really doesn't have active cancer, and you're not going to give him any adjuvant chemotherapy. So I don't think this is truly a cancer-related thrombosis. I think this is a post-surgical thrombosis. And I think you could treat this particular patient with any standard anticoagulation regimen for a provoked event where the risk factors have been resolved with the exception of the obesity. And to focus on the ASH choosing wisely, point number six specifies in somebody like this, one should receive three months duration of anticoagulation for a provoked event where the risk factors have been resolved. The ASH choosing wisely point number two specifies that a provoked venous thromboembolism in the setting of major transient risk factors does not require hypocoagulability testing. And as hematologists, we've tried to convince everybody to test for hereditary abnormalities that might cause thrombosis. Now we're backing off and saying after 20 years, we shouldn't be testing them. And that's because that even in unprovoked events, probably the highest yield I think I've ever heard about is 20%. And it's generally a lot lower. And then when you find an a mutation, it generally doesn't change what you'll do. Now, another question that comes up is if you have somebody who doesn't have a provoked event, we know that there are patients that present first with a venous thromboembolism and are later found to have cancer. And the three guidelines, for the most part, don't mention any extensive screening for occult cancer, even though we know this does occur. There was one study, the SOMA trial, which stands for screening for occult malignancy in patients with symptomatic idiopathic venous thromboembolism, that was published in 2004. And with intensive screening, they showed that, that they could indeed detect most hidden malignancies with high sensitivity that they could detect them earlier at an earlier stage. But the primary endpoint was survival and this was no different. ESMO is the only one who comments on screening for occult malignancy. And they, they recommended that patients who had an idiopathic venous thromboembolism should only have a physical examination, fecal occult blood test, chest x-ray, urologic visit in men and gynecologic visit in women. And that more expensive examinations, CT scans, endoscopies, and tumor markers should only be used if you had a high clinical suspicion of malignancy. Um, again, you can decide you know, how you want to deal with this. The other guidelines really don't discuss it. So some teaching points. In the surgical oncology setting, where you have active cancer or you're, you're planning additional therapy, um, the consensus recommendations are for the use of low-dose unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin as prophylaxis um, unless there's a contraindication due to active bleeding or very high risk of bleeding. I don't think in this patient there really was a very high risk of bleeding and probably should have gotten pharmacologic prophylaxis.
Mechanical methods can be used in conjunction with pharmacologic prophylaxis, but not as monotherapy, again, unless pharmacologic therapy is contraindicated. And for patients, again, with, with active disease um, or that are going to be receiving uh, additional therapy, um, there's an elevated risk of venous thromboembolism after discharge from surgery for up to four weeks. And so extended prophylaxis is recommended for patients who have high risk features by ASCO and NCCN and then considered the standard of care by ESMO. So there's a little difference in the strength of recommendations. I'm going to move on to the second case. And that's a 60-year-old female who presents with fatigue and unexplained weight loss. She's found to have a pancreatic mass. She's considered to have resectable surgery after resectable cancer and undergoes a Whipple procedure and is treated with low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis. The pathology unfortunately re reveals the margins are positive and she's referred to you to discuss additional therapy. Um, on her discharge, she's found to have a white count of 10,000, a platelet count of 450,000, and a hemoglobin of 10. You plan to give adjuvant chemotherapy and radiation. So would you consider prophylactic anticoagulation? During her outpatient therapy, we saw that in those original numbers, Gettings and Magman presented her risk could be high. If so, what agent would you use? How long do you treat her? And what are the risks versus the benefits to giving prophylactic therapy? The ASCO, NCCN, and ASMO guidelines don't recommend routine prophylaxis for anticoagulation except in the setting of myeloma patients who are to receive either chemotherapy and an IMID with dexamethasone and then ask you to look at their estimated degree of risk as to which agent you might want to use, whether you would use a low molecular weight heparin, warfarin, or aspirin. Now the ACCP guideline indicates that if you've had a previous venous thromboembolism, if there's immobilization, hormonal therapy, or angiogenesis inhibitors, these could be additional indications that might sway you to consider prophylaxis. The ESMO guideline notes that patients with lung or pancreatic cancer have an increased risk, and, and, and therefore they might benefit from low molecular weight hay prophylaxis. The NCCN guideline states that you might consider prophylaxis in high-risk ambulatory patients as defined by the risk model by Corona. And I'll show you that in the next slide. However, I think really what we don't have is a good estimate of risk versus benefit for an individual patient based on differences in treatment and, and individuality of patients. This is the Corana predictive score for chemotherapy-associated venous thromboembolism. And it gives you certain points. Again, very high risk is stomach and pancreas. It gives you a score of two. Then lung, lymphoma, and other cancers, you get a score of one. The pre-chemotherapy platelet count is you get a score if you're 350 or above. A hemoglobin less than 10, a leukocyte count that's greater than 11,000, and being obese with a BMI of 35 or higher. And again, in this patient that I presented, she has pancreatic cancer. She gets a score of two for that, and a platelet count of 450,000, so she has three. If you look in the bottom right, this gives her a, a risk of three, of high risk and correlates with somewhere around a 7% risk using this model. So it may be helpful in this situation. What is the information related to pancreatic cancer and prophylaxis? Well, there was a large study, the PROTEX study, 
that was performed in over a thousand patients who are ambulatory with advanced or locally advanced cancer who were receiving chemotherapy and they were either given nandroparin, which is a low molecular weight heparin we don't have in this country, or no prophylaxis. And they found there was a reduction in venous thromboembolic events in lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, and GI malignancies. And again, um, the risk reduction in pancreatic cancer here was from 8.3% to 5.9%. There was a smaller study the UK Fragm study using daltaparin or Fragmin in 123 patients with pancreatic cancer who are randomized to receive gemcitabine with or without daltaparin. They had more impressive percentages of reduction from 23% to 3.4% with lethal venous thromboembolic events only occurring in those who were in the control arm and furthermore, that at, this was given for 12 weeks, and after 12 weeks, there was still a benefit after the daltaparin was stopped in terms of, of survival, but um, it reduced over time. So some teaching points. Pancreatic cancer has a high risk for venous thromboembolism. Chemotherapy adds to the risk. Unfortunately, the use of biomarkers that I discussed earlier in a slide is not proven as to, as to whether it adds any help in terms of estimating risk. A low molecular weight heparin is the preferred choice, and in this country our choices are enoxaparin or daltaparin. We have some issues though with those drugs because low molecular weight heparin is excreted renally so if one has a low creatinine clearance below 30 that we shouldn't use it. And then I, what I found is at least in one of my patients where I, he was sent home from the hospital on low molecular weight heparin, his copay was $400. He says, you got to find me something cheaper than that. Uh, and so uh, he ended up on rivaroxaban where his copay was only $40. So, and this is in addition to being an, an injectable. So I think there are some issues with giving um, the, the anticoagulation prophylactically. Okay, the third case is a 65-year-old man with adenocarcinoma of the lung, EGFR and ALP negative. He's found to have N2 involvement on his PET scan, and this is confirmed with mediastinoscopy. So you plan to treat him with carboplatin and methotrexate, and you give him three cycles and do a repeat CT scan of the chest. And he's had a partial response, but the, the radiologist calls you up and says he has incidental segmental pulmonary emboli in both lungs. So you order a duplex Doppler examination and find he's got a non-occlusive non iliofemoral thrombus in the right leg. So he's got DVTs and PEs that hadn't been recognized. So some questions. Does an incidental pulmonary embolism found on a routine CT scan warrant any treatment? Does it confer the same risk as a symptomatic pulmonary embolism? Which anticoagulant or anticoagulants should you use to treat his venous thromboembolism if you think he needs treatment? And should you consider placing an inferior vena cava filter? The only guideline that really discusses incidental pulmonary emboli in cancer patients is the ASCO guidelines. They discuss this in the written, in, in the the text portion, but in the recommendations, they really don't tease that out with symptomatic pulmonary emboli. Um, and so there, there really aren't any specific recommendations in the guidelines. Now there are several studies that have looked at this. One is by Den Exter, published in JCO in 2010. And they defined symptomatic versus asymptomatic patients. They had 51 asymptomatic and 144 symptomatic patients. And they found similar rates of recurrence of, venous of pulmonary embolism, bleeding, and mortality. 
So that would suggest that it didn't have a more benign prognosis. There was a retrospective study of 96 patients of unsuspected PE matched to symptomatic controls and there was a hazard ratio of 1.5 for the unsuspected ones. In fact, if you looked at the segmental PEs, the hazard ratio was over two. But interestingly, it was one for patients who had isolated subsegmental pulmonary emboli. And they actually made the point that there were four of nine patients who didn't receive any anticoagulation. And on the next CT scan, they didn't have any new ones and the former one was gone. And so that might be one exception where you would maybe not give anticoagulation. Um, in another prospective observational trial in cancer patients with unsuspected PEs, most were treated with anticoagulation. And they looked at recurrence of venous thromboembolism, bleeding, and mortality at 3, 6, and 12 months. The bleeding risk stayed the same at those, those time points at 4.9%. The bleeding risk increased from th 3 months to 6 months from 8 0.5% to 18%, but was stable at, at 12 months. The mortality rate increased progressively from 11% to 18% to 43%, probably reflecting progression of disease as these patients were not having pulmonary emboli. And so, again, how, you know, making firm recommendations sometimes is difficult, and there was a position statement in the International Society of, from the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis, chaired by Karana, that talked about the issues of trying to study this with variable populations, how you define this. They preferred the term incidental over asymptomatic. Um, and again, the differences in CT scanning um, that could contribute to differences in, in outcomes. So some teaching points. All of the current guidelines specify low molecular weight heparin as the anticoagulant of choice for venous thromboembolism. The only low molecular weight heparin that's actually been studied in cancer patients is deltaparin in the CLOT study. And this showed superiority over warfarin in preventing recurrence of venous thromboembolism. Now, there was a study published at ASH this past year, the Ketch study from Canada, where they used another low molecular weight heparin, tinzaparin, and that showed similar findings to the CLOT study, that it was more effective than warfarin in preventing recurrent venous thromboembolism. In this country, most of us use enoxaparin. That's what's on hospital formularies primarily. The data for use of enoxaparin is really extrapolated from trials in non-cancer patients. And really, there isn't any reliable subgroup analysis in those trials to, to, to really make firm recommendations related to cancer patients, but it's sort of what we do. The optimal duration for treatment with a low molecular weight heparin has really not been studied. But the general recommendations are for six months and then longer if the patient has active cancer or continues on treatment. So some teaching points. Um, the ASH choosing wisely, point number three is, don't use inferior vena cava filters routinely in patients with acute venous thromboembolism, including those who have an initial pulmonary embolism. Related to cancer patients, there is a small amount of literature that overall, in summary, suggests that patients who have inferior vena cava filters placed still can have venous thromboembolism with a greater risk of deep venous thrombosis in the inferior vena cava and the legs, probably because we've induced more stasis. And then patients who have advanced cancer, and many of the patients will have advanced cancer, who have IVC filters have short life expectancies and we haven't been ever able to show an improvement in survival. So 
For some teaching points, insertion of an IVC filter is indicated only if there are contraindications to anticoagulant therapy. Once that contraindication, uh, the risk of bleeding is reduced, if there's an IVC filter in place, then one should either start the anticoagulation or resume it to reduce the risk of recurrent venous thromboembolism in the inferior vena cava and the legs. It may be considered as an adjunct to anticoagulation in patients who've progressed with thrombosis despite being placed on what appeared to be an adequate dose of low molecular weight heparin to limit the, the extension of an existing thrombus or new thrombi. And for one of the issues that comes up is what about patients who have brain tumors or brain metastases? I know I used to get into arguments with the neurosurgeons several years ago. And for patients with primary central nervous system malignancies, again, anticoagulation is recommended as it is for other patients. And there was an abstract at the ASH meeting last year that looked at the presence of brain metastases. And they found that the risk of intracranial bleeding is the same whether patients are treated with enoxaparin or no anticoagulation at about 25% at one year. So again, you can still have bleeding related to brain metastases even without heparins, and it appears to be about the same with heparin. The last case is a 64-year-old female with left-sided breast cancer. It's stage two. It's a PT2 lesion. She's treated with lumpectomy and sentinel node sampling. She has a right Mediport placed and begins adjuvant doxorubicin and cyclophosphamide therapy. After cycle two, she develops right arm pain and swelling. A duplex Doppler examination reveals a subclavian venous thrombosis around the catheter. The catheter is functioning well. There's no signs of infection uh, of the catheter. So some questions. Should she have received thromboprophylaxis to prevent this catheter-associated DVT? Should the catheter be removed after the thrombosis is developed? Which anticoagulant should we use for this deep venous thrombosis, and how long should we continue it? Current, none of the current guidelines recommend routine thromboprophylaxis for catheter-related venous thrombosis. There was a meta-analysis that looked at seven randomized controlled trials, three using low molecular weight heparin, four with low-dose warfarin that did not show any benefit. In those studies, daltaparin was used at two different doses, a lower dose of 2,500 and, and a higher dose of 5,000 milligrams. Enoxaparin at a standard 40 milligram daily dose and warfarin at what we used to use as a low dose to prevent these compared to placebo or controls. And there were a lot of problems with these studies, the wide range of incidents reported, how we define catheter-associated thrombosis. Some included fibrin sheaths or catheter occlusion and underpowerment of the trials. And so it looks as though symptomatic catheter-related thrombi occur at about four to five percent nobody knows what the real incidence is in asymptomatic. And so currently we don't recommend any thromboprophylaxis. The other, another point is that, that the catheter doesn't need to be removed unless it's not functioning, infected, or no longer needed. Now if it's down in the, in, into the, the um, superior vena cava and you have a superior vena cava thrombus, that might be a little different. But if it's properly placed and functioning, you should leave it in because you run into the problem that you have to take it out, then put in another one to accomplish the same purpose as you had for the first one to administer chemotherapy and then balance the, the bleeding risk and being off of the, the, the heparin. The preferred therapy is a low molecular weight heparin. You treat for three months after completion of chemotherapy. It's a provoked event. And we often use now these smaller catheters and on occasion pick lines that are placed in superficial veins. 
And William Gertz presented a session at, at uh, ASH as well on catheter-associated thrombosis. And I haven't seen this anywhere else in print, but he suggested in these smaller superficial veins, you, if you leave the catheter in, you could treat it a lower dose of, of low molecular weight heparin in the seven, 30, 50 to 75 percent range and then leave it in and then continue treatment for two weeks after removal of that superficial catheter. What about newer oral anticoagulants that are the rage for atrial fibrillation? We used to call them novel agents. Well now after three of them or four of them, there's not too many, they're not very novel. We used to call them new, we can say newer, but now the preferred term is target-specific oral anticoagulants. We all love targeted therapies. The problem with them is that there are no clinical trials specifically testing their efficacy in cancer patients. And so we use them uh, on occasion, but again, we don't know how they compare to low molecular weight heparin like we do with warfarin. These are oral drugs. As with any oral drugs, there's compliance issues, issues with absorption, and there are issues with drug-drug interactions. Again, for the anti-10A inhibitors, if you have a strong CYP3A4 inducer, your level is lower. And so again, we have a lot of these logistical issues to, to deal with, and we don't have good specific antidotes in the event of bleeding. Uh, and that remains a problem too. Often we have to wait for the, the effect to wear off. And, and again, the NCCN guideline, I'll close with, um, does outline these newer agents and the antidotes available, but I'm not going to get into to that, that discussion today.